Um, if you are new here, somehow you found us, maybe through our website, Facebook, or maybe a friend. So welcome. Um, we do keep our website and Facebook very up to date. So if you want to connect with us on there, that would be awesome. And you can get updates about all our upcoming events and um, just general articles that we share. We do these programs every month. So thank you Elsa for being with us this month. And then next month, um, it'll be on the second Tuesday. Usually it's the first Tuesday, but we're gonna have June Blotnick from Clean Air Carolina come talk about air pollution and its effects um which is a pretty hot topic recently so excited for that we have we lots have of signature programs so um i just kind of listed them there so um if there's some that you're interested um, in check them out on our website and um you can learn more about them there and we have lots of information um listed there if you're interested some of these things we haven't been able to do this year but we're looking forward to doing them maybe later in the year or next year. Uh, we have a couple upcoming outings in April. So there's a Forces of Nature um, series that will be going on Thursdays in April. Um, that's hosted by the City of Concord Parks and Rec, but I believe we'll be partnering with them on that. And then on April 29th at 6.30, I will be hosting an introduction to the iNaturalist app. So if you haven't heard of that app, it's a way to identify anything um, in nature. So plants, animals, maybe a bone, um, anything you find, it will help you ID it. And it's a, a great um, citizen science database. Um, but I'll be sharing information about it and about the upcoming City Nature Challenge, which is a worldwide event that will be going on April 30th through May 3rd. And the Charlotte Metro region is participating in that. So we hope to um, help them out and get some observations for that. So I'm really excited to hear from Elsa. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce her and then I'm gonna let her take it from here. So she is a professor at NC State in the Department of Applied Ecology. She does research in her lab on the effects of effect effects of urbanization and climate change on insects, including bees and ants. She maintains an active native bee outreach program and developed outreach materials that are used statewide, including a bee ID guide um, co-authored with Hannah Levinson. Um, I'll put a link to that in the chat in case you haven't been able to see it. Um, it's really cool. Um, after completing her PhD in entomology at NC State, she worked as a science writer and editor for American Scientist magazine. Since returning to research, her work has taken her up and down the East Coast from the Carolina Sandhills to the streets of New York City. So thank you for being with us, Elsa, and I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. And I'm going to <laughs> see if I remember how to share my screen in Teams. One moment. Okay, can you see my title slide? Yep, it looks good. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, I think my, my mission this evening is to share with you some information about wild bees in the state of North Carolina, including some background on their life cycles and especially on their nesting habitats. Um, we often think of planting flowers as a way to support bees. And we'll touch on that, but there's this whole other side of their life where they're hidden away inside nests for most of the year. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about um, ways to support them in their nesting habits. And then along the way, I'll point out um, a few sort of field marks to help you um, get ready to recognize a few of these bees, especially the ones that are coming up in the next month or two, some of our early spring bees. All right. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of how essential bees are to, to the world. Um, they're responsible for, well, animal pollinators, not just bees, but bees are really the heavy hitters among them, um, are responsible for pollinating about 87% of flowering plants on the planet and about 75% of crop plants. 
Um, and you may have heard there's kind of a common trope nowadays, like thank a bee for one in every three bites of food. And that's actually rightly starting to be questioned more and more. Um, there's not really a lot of evidence to back up that that's the proportion of our diet that they support. The most recent analyses have showed that maybe 10% of our calories come from bee pollinated foods, um, but the majority of vitamins A and C. We're getting a lot of our calories from like grains, wheat, rice, things that are wind pollinated. So we don't necessarily need bees for our calories, but we do need them for our nutrition. And that's what's shown in these um, photos here that show you side by side, like what breakfast might look like if you did have bees in the picture and if you did not. A lot less nutritious without. And this all of course comes from the pollinating activity of bees and honeybees are the quintessential pollinator, the kind of archetype that comes to mind. And they really are because they can be managed, they can be put in boxes and put where you need them they're responsible for probably well over half of crop pollination, but um, that still leaves a large share of pollination to be done. And that's native bees and other animals that do the rest of that pollination. And they can enhance yield even when honeybees are present, when they're present at the maximum level. If you add diversity in the system, you still get higher rates of pollination of seed set of fruit set. And the first time I heard that, I was kind of scratching my head, like, how does that even work? Like, if you're maxed out with honeybees, how could adding another type of bee possibly make a difference? And so I actually want to give a couple of examples of how that works. So all of these other bees that we're talking about um, make up worldwide about 20,000 different species. In the U.S., about 4,000. Here in North Carolina, 560 um, at latest count. And there's a of shapes, sizes, colors. We have every, everything from these little few millimeters long sweat bees um, to bumblebees and carpenter bees, which are our biggest bee here. And they all have different seasonal timing, different behavior. And that combination of, of behaviors um, is what really makes a difference when you talk about how they're contributing to the ecosystem. So one example in strawberries, um, comes from a nice study that showed that the, you know, the, the sort of classic pollinators like honeybees, the big bees, if they land on a strawberry flower, they bring more pollen than the little bees, but they kind of, it all gets dropped in one spot. They don't move it around the flower a lot. And all of these little sort of furry bits in the middle of the flower are female parts that need to get pollinated in order to have like a good fruit. So the big bees bring a lot of pollen, but they don't spread it around. And when the little bees come behind um, and forage on the same flower, they don't necessarily contribute that much pollen, but they move around all the pollen that was already there, resulting in better pollinated fruits. More like this one. Can you all actually see my mouse if I'm pointing at things on the screen? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so you get better pollinated fruits like this one instead of pollinated ones like that that don't develop fully. There are other ways that behavioral differences can affect pollination instead of within the flower across a whole plant. Um, there are cases in trees, shrubs, vines where um, some bees tend to work higher on the plant, others work lower on the plant, and together you end up with overall more um, flowers more thoroughly pollinated. Or my last example of how diversity enhances pollination comes from a nice study in sunflower. Um, this was from a hybrid sunflower system where they're planted um, sort of plants that are meant to be pollen donors in one row and females that are meant to receive pollen in the next row so that you end up with hybrid sunflower between you know, one row pollinating the next. But honeybees, efficient foragers that they are, like to get in a row and just keep going straight down it. Um, but when they encounter a wild bee on a flower that mixes up their routine, they switch rows and they themselves become more efficient pollinators because they're encountering other kinds of bees in the system. So we've seen that there is a lot of bee diversity in the world in North Carolina and then that diversity matters to their function in the environment. But given all of that variation, like what actually ties bees together? What really defines a bee? If we have everything from this little waspy looking cuckoo bee to our big fuzzy carpenter bees, what actually makes them the same thing? Um, and there's a couple of things that all bees share in common. One of them is reliance on pollen as a food for their larvae. And they all go about getting it in different ways, which we'll see in a minute, but they all eat pollen. 
And then the anatomical tell um, is one you're not likely to see in the field, but if you stick a bee under a microscope, you're going to find branched hairs like this somewhere on its body. It kind of just looks like it's got split ends. Um, and those branched hairs are better at holding on to pollen. So it's kind of linked to this pollen eating lifestyle that bees have in common. And so given that sort of pollen centric life cycle, um, we'll have a look at sort of all of the stages in it. And I'll start with this bee out foraging on a flower. This is a leaf cutting bee who carries her pollen on her belly um, instead of on her legs. We'll get to that later. But anyway, this is kind of what we think of when we think of the word bee. It's like a you know, merry insect buzzing around among flowers. And that's actually a pretty fleeting bit of their life cycle. That's where, we're start, where we will start. If we're lucky, we might also see them kind of collecting construction materials for a nest. This is um, a bee that nests in an old beetle hole in a piece of wood. This might be one a person drilled for her, I don't know. But anyway, she's collecting leaf materials to take in it and she will like wallpaper the, the nest with her leaf materials. So if we're lucky, we see them collecting construction materials. We definitely see them out collecting nectar and pollen. But where are they taking it all? They're gonna go hide it away somewhere that we never see, which in this case is back in the end of this wooden tunnel. And you can see there's this stash of pollen that the mother bee has collected and she lays an egg on it. And then she seals it off with a little nest wall. And that mom who laid that egg will never see the bee that hatches out of it. The bee that hatches out of it is actually a larva. Um, they go through several developmental stages before they look like a recognizable bee, but it's still a bee. Um, and so the larva hatches, eats that pollen that the mom stashed for it, and then eventually develops into a pure larva and finally a pupa, which is this transitional phase that's done eating. It's just converting all of its body parts from larval to adult form. And then the new adult bee will emerge. So these steps are shared by all bees in some way, but they all do things differently. And to kind of help us make sense of this huge array of bee diversity, um, I wanna kind of divide up this life cycle according to three major variations. One of which is social organization, who actually does the work of foraging and collecting nesting materials and um, setting up the nest, then diet and then nesting location. So we'll look at social organization first. And even though honeybees are kind of our, honeybees and bumblebees are kind of our archetypal bees and they live in, in hives or in colonies, um, the majority of our bees are actually solitary. About 60% of them um, just live on their own. Every bee is her own queen, her own worker. She makes her own nest, collects her own pollen, her own nectar, lays her own eggs, does the whole shebang. And here are just a few examples of some solitary bees. Obviously, it's a tiny fraction of the 60% of our 560 species that are out there. Um, we'll look at actually all of these species in a little more detail later. And then about 16% of our species are social, um, where they have a queen who doesn't do much work outside the nest. Um, in all of our native social species, there's kind of an annual life cycle where the, the queen over winter starts a new colony in the spring. So she does a little bit of worker-like work in the spring where she does like, start building the nest, collects nectar, collects pollen, starts laying eggs. But then her first batch of offspring take over all that work. And then so the rest of the summer, she doesn't go out. Um, and then she just focuses on laying eggs and all of her kids do the work and help her raise you know, more daughters and sons who then in the um, late summer will reproduce and then the new mated queens will overwinter. So that's the, the social life cycle and we see that in all of our native bumblebees, except for a couple of parasitic species um, that mooch off of other bumblebee nests. And then um, many of our little tiny like quarter inch long sweat bees are also social. They have small social colonies anywhere from a couple of workers to you know, 100 workers or so um, in little underground nests. And then finally, a remarkably large share, almost a quarter of all of our bee species are actually parasitic, um, which means that they actually don't collect pollen themselves. Their larvae still require pollen to develop, but they sneak into other bees' nests, lay their eggs, and then their larvae eat the pollen that some other bee mom collected. Um, and these bees aren't even equipped to collect their own pollen. If you go to them under a microscope, you'll still find branched hairs on there somewhere that could have pollen sticking to them, but they don't have like 
those big elaborate structures that other bees have to pack on a lot of pollen and bring it home. So they're not even capable of making a nest. They can only break into other bees' nests. So those are our variations in social organization, kind of who's doing this work of nesting and foraging. And then diet is another really important kind of axis of bee diversity. And it's really um, harder to categorize into just specialists, just generalists. There's really a range of pickiness in bee diets. Um, from the, the, the very pickiest end, things like the squash bee that recognize only a few plants as food. Like the squash bee will collect pollen only from members of the genus Cucurbita, which is pumpkins, gourds, squash, um, but those other, like the ones with the big orange flowers. Um, and they won't really recognize anything else as food. So super specialized, they have to have that plant or they won't live there. All the way up to super generalists like bumblebees, like our common Eastern bumblebee has a very long season where the queens come out in like end of March or April, and then you see workers and males all the way up until first frost. So to last that long, they've got to eat a whole bunch of different things depending on what's in bloom. And in fact, they can kind of assess the quality of those different foods and balance their diet accordingly, depending on what's available. And then there's a whole bunch of bees kind of somewhere in the middle who might have some strong preferences but aren't really that specialized. They can kind of roll with the punches and eat what's out to some extent. Um, our blue orchard bees are an example of that where they have a strong preference for some fruit trees, for red buds, for cane fruits, um, but it's not like they have to have red bud or they die. And so about 10 or 20 percent of our bee species in North Carolina somewhere on the specialist kind of spectrum. And that's useful to know just if you're actually planning a habitat for bees. And I said I wasn't going to talk a whole lot about food for bees tonight, um, but it's useful to keep in mind that a good 10 or 20 percent of our species really must have particular foods, whereas the generalists can eat whatever. Um, this pie chart shows for 85 of the specialist bee species in the East Coast, what is it that they're specialized on? So you can see Asteraceae, like the sunflowers and the asters. Our um, goldenrod is another big one in that group that, that bees specialize on. Um, so having Asteraceae around is going to be very important. Ericaceae, like blueberries and rhododendrons, is another big one. There are quite a few blueberry specialists. Willows, um, Solanaceae, that's the tomato family. So things like um, Physalis, like the, shoot, what's it called? ground cherry or ground horse nettle, like that group of, of plants um, also has some specialist bees. So if those plants are in your landscape, like the specialists can eat and the generalists will probably get by fine too. So those are some of the variations in bee diet, like what is this pollen that's getting collected and that the larvae are eating? And then finally, what I wanna spend most of the time on is nesting the kind of invisible stage of their life cycle. And for this, I want to divide our bees up into nine different groups based on what sort of material they nest in and how they find or make those nests. So bees um, in North Carolina nest in the soil or they nest in stems and wood. Um, this could be um, stems that are naturally hollow or pithy, or it could be holes in wood that like in dead wood that beetles, for example, burrowed, um, or sort of other nooks, crannies, and cavities, things like voids in stone walls, old rodent burrows, birdhouses. That's this cavity category. And then how do the bees actually interact with those? Um, substrates, they may be builders, meaning they actually build their own nest, they dig a tunnel, or they construct um, a little yurt-like shelter um, out of resins and things. You know, they, they might actually build something themselves or they might rent, um, which means that they're finding some pre-existing hole that a different insect created or that a different animal created and they're just moving in, or they can be parasites like I talked about in social organization. You can also, you know, that applies to nesting as well. You don't build your own, you don't really find your own, you just move into somebody else's. So how does our bee diversity divide up then among these nine categories? The, the biggest 
the, the majority, um, 54% are bees who dig their own tunnels, they're builders who nest in the soil. So if you had to just had a random bee in front of you and you had to guess, you, you would have a decent odds of getting it right if you said it, it digs tunnels in soil. There are also um, a lot, most of the parasites um, in our diversity are also parasites of soil nesting bees. So that's a big share. And then there are a few who will use pre-existing tunnels in the ground that like some other bee like or wasp had dug and then these bees come along behind and take over that space after it's no longer actively used. Then in stems and wood, most bees who use that, about 14% of our total diversity are renters. They find pre-existing holes or tunnels um, and move into those. They do some modification, but they don't do the digging themselves. Um, and then a handful are parasites or actually active diggers in wood. And then finally, cavities. You can almost not see these small um, bubbles over here that represent a small percentage of the bee diversity. Um, but especially these cavity renters, bumblebees fall in this group. So it's a small but very important group. So we'll look through some of these um, individually, starting with our soil builders and their parasites. And I want to start by introducing you to a few of the particular groups that we're, shoot, they're probably out right now. The red maples are blooming, which tells me that like the first mining bees are also probably out. Um, so this is the genus Andrina, which contains bees known as mining bees. They're entirely ground nesters who dig their own tunnels. There's 97 species of them in North Carolina. Um, far too many to like recognize them by, you know, as individual species when you see them um, in nature, but the group as a whole is pretty easy to recognize. And probably most of us have or have walked by or know of um, some yards that look kind of like this in the spring, sparsely vegetated, lots of bare soil, um, and lots of little holes in them that kind of look like anthills. And if you look closely, this is what you can see coming and going from these holes are these little mining bees. And besides nesting in the ground, this group contains a lot of um, pollen specialists, a large number of the species, and they're all specialized on different things. There's some who will only um, collect pollen from spring beauty, Claytonia. There's a violet specialist um, that's really common in suburban yards that are full of violets, but it's stealthy. Um, it kind of zips in and out of the flowers really fast and you don't see it unless you're like really looking for it. But if you have violets in your guide, you probably have Andrina violi. There's also specialists on Zizia, on Willow, um, and then there's a whole host of others that, you know, I'm not gonna list here. Um, there are also plenty of generalists and those are the ones that we see, especially on red maple right now, the very first bees of the spring, um, end up on red maple and the mining bees are among them. Um, and then some of them are also actually economically important pollinators of fruit trees. And so if you see, oh, my animation came up too fast. Um, so if you see them in the field, how would you know if you actually have a mining bee? Um, one of the kind of field marks that can help this group stand out are these little, um, lines of sort of fuzz along the inside of their eye. It almost looks like eyebrows, except it's running on the inside of their eye instead of over their eye. And those um, marks often stand out and are something you can see even without a microscope. And also look for if it's a female bee and it's collecting pollen, she'll have it packed like on her entire leg. It's not like one neat packet like a honeybee or a bumblebee, but it's everywhere. And so if you are watching one of those patches of sort of sparsely vegetated soil in a yard and looking for mining bees, it's likely that you will also spot some of these um, nomad bees or cuckoo bees who are also active in the early spring and mostly parasitize mining bee nests. They also parasitize a few sweat bees, but they're um, mainly mining bees. And there's 47 species of these in North Carolina, really hard to tell apart. Um, you can tell some major groups apart, like there's the, the black and yellow stripey group and there's the, the orange group. Um, as far as telling them to species, it's tough. But if you see a waspy looking um, orange or yellow and black bee flying around one of those um, nesting aggregations in the spring, chances are it's a nomada. 
And so they'll go in and lay their eggs. Like they'll wait for the resident bee to leave and then they'll go in and lay their eggs um, on the pollen that the resident bee had gathered for her own larvae. And then that, the larva that was supposed to eat that pollen will die. Um, but having these around is generally a good sign that you've got like a healthy host population enough to support these parasites living in the population. So Andrina is not the only one who will make these um, nesting aggregations that are about to start popping up. Um, Calides, the cellophane bees, is another group that does this very commonly in the spring and especially in sort of suburban areas, you'll see them. Um, and these are also, they can be um, pollinators of you know, fruit trees and cane fruits. There are several specialists, one of them even is a specialist on blueberries, um, but they'll also visit red buds, blackberries. I see them on red buds a lot. And they look a lot like mining bees, but a couple things to watch out for if you've got a group of nests and you're trying to figure out who, which species is or which group is in it. Watch for these very strong hair stripes on the abdomen. This is somebody like diving down her nest hole. Sometimes that's kind of all you see. Um, some of the mining bees will have stripes, but they're not usually like this bold. And then also watch for this kind of heart-shaped flat face. And then she doesn't have that little eyebrow inside of her eye. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> For some reason, my arrow keys don't work in this view, and I've got to use my mouse, but it's not very good. So those are a few of the ground nesting bees that you're about to see um, very soon in the next few weeks or a month or so. Of course, there are many more. As the season rolls on, you'll see green sweat bees, sunflower bees. This is the squash bee. Um, blueberry bees are also part of that kind of early crowd. So, of course, we're not going to talk about all of them, but those are some of the ones that you'll see soon. And so we've looked a lot at the outside of the nest, um, but what's actually going on under the ground? Um, usually you just see this little lump of dirt or at best maybe a chimney is the most elaborate thing you're gonna see on the outside. But of course the business end is underground where you can't see it. Um, this is an illustration of a bee nest um, and there's a whole range of complexities. This is a pretty elaborate branching structure where the bee has you know, made a tunnel and then builds a cell, fills it with pollen, lays an egg, seals it off and repeats. And eventually this whole tunnel will get backfilled as other tunnels, you know, as it gets filled up and other ones get used. Or they can have really simple architecture. This is um, an illustration of the nest of a rose mallow bee or hibiscus bee. I often see them in our um, okra flowers. They also go in hibiscus, like that whole group of plants. And they'll build just one or two um, cells per nest and they'll be just in this straight column like this is a cross section the, the surface of the soil is up here um, and this is what the bee has built and these bees tend to nest in very hard kind of clay soil they'll actually collect little droplets of water and put it on the soil to make it easier to dig or you can have these super elaborate, you know, branching nesting structures. This is uh, an illustration of a cross section of a nest of a little social sweat bee um, that has, you know, a small colony, maybe a dozen, two dozen workers um, and a queen laying all the eggs. And finally, here's an actual photograph of what this might look like inside. I'm honestly not sure exactly how this picture was taken. If this was somebody digging, I think it was in the process of excavating this nest and they got just exactly this shot where the bee is looking in from one side and then you can see the egg. This is an egg, not a larva, um, on the pollen ball there in the nest interior. And so given that about 60% of our, or 54% of our bees are ground nesting um, you know, builders, that makes ground you know, soil management very important for bee conservation. And yet we actually don't know a whole lot about how to create habitat for ground nesting bees. Um, at this point, our best bet is kind of benign neglect. There are quite a few studies that have compared areas that have them and don't have them and tried to reach some conclusions, but there are no examples that I know of of finding an area that didn't have them modifying it and then having bees nest there. So um, we're still a little bit hampered in our ability to manage and like create habitat for these bees, but we do know some conditions that seem to encourage them, which include a high sand content in the soil, not a lot of vegetation, which seems to get in the way of, you know, being able to tunnel in the soil, 
Morning sun exposure seems to be pretty appealing, sort of south facing slopes. Some bees especially like to nest in areas with little rocks and cobbles, um, sort of like Oreo sized river stones um, make nice landmarks and kind of moderate the climate. Um, some bees nest in vertical banks. So if you have, um, you know, like an eroded stream edge or something, keep an eye in there and see if anybody's nesting in that bank. Um, and they tend to like lower soil moisture, not soggy soil. So sort of you know, irrigated areas are less likely to be nested in than drier areas. So those are some things that they like. And things that they don't like um, are deep tillage. Most um, nests are in the top sort of six to 12 inches of soil. So a lot of digging is going to disturb most of those nests and destroy the, you know, the immatures before they get a chance to emerge again. Dense turf seems to be a deterrent. It's hard to get through. Same, same for thick mulch, reduces access to the soil. Same for landscape fabric. And I already mentioned irrigation tends to make um, soil less attractive. So those are things to avoid if you want to encourage ground nesting bees. By the same token, if you have them in an area that you just really can't cope with them there, um, these are fairly innocuous things you can do to discourage them um, from nesting in an area. So those are our soil nesters. Um, and let's look for a minute at stem and wood nesters, particularly the renters and their parasites. And this is a group of bees where we know quite a bit more about their nesting habits just because they're up above ground and they will readily nest in structures that we give them and that we can open up. Um, they're a lot easier to study. Um, so here are a few examples of bees um, using tunnels in wood. And if you were to be actually open those up inside, often what you'll find is a sort of linear nest. They don't have a lot of options for, you know, branching structures like those ground nesting bees. They're just working with a tunnel. And so if the entrance is over here, the bee will go to the back, um, pack that first cell full of pollen, lay an egg. This is a large larva. It's been at it for a while, build her partition and then repeat all the way to the front of the nest. Um, and here are a few different variations on that. These are both from different kinds of mason bees. This is from a leaf cutting bee who instead of using mud like this one or chewed up leaf pulp like this one actually uses leaf pieces to sort of wallpaper her nest and make the walls in between chambers. And because these bees are nesting in you know above ground cavities that's something that we can give them um, and it can it seems like it's probably a beneficial thing to do the jury is still out on some fronts um, but as long as you're not putting out a huge number of holes and you are doing some maintenance every few years. It seems like adding nesting habitats like this, like bee hotels um, into an environment can help um, bee populations increase, can help replace missing habitats like you know, hollow twigs and stems or beetle holes and dead wood that we tend to like clean away or tidy up um, in more urban or manicured environments. So we can put some of that missing habitat back by adding nest boxes or bee hotels. So these are all examples of artificial nesting habitat that's been added to habitats. And I've got a whole other talk on that, so I'm not really gonna give um, a whole lot more detail about bee hotels tonight, although certainly if you've got questions about them, we can um, come back to it at the end. If you look into it, a bee hotel does seem like more maintenance work than you wanna do. There's also things you can do to just encourage natural nesting in the landscape without concentrating bees into a specific um, container. Um, you can plant plants that naturally have hollow or pithy stems, things like sumac, elder, sunflower, rose, blackberry, and raspberry all make good nesting substrates for bees who are looking for a place to nest. And in all of these cases, they don't nest in living material. They nest in you know, broken twigs that have died or in last year's sunflower stems that have dried. Um, so you do have to leave kind of a little bit of mess for this to work. You can't tidy away every dead, dead bit of plant material. Um, if you do want to tidy away your dead plant material, there's um, the North Carolina Botanical Garden has taken to making these neat little wattle fences out of their cut back stems and they do see um, you know, bees nesting in those, which I thought was a clever idea. Of course, we know nothing about really how successful those bees are, how this affects their populations, but it seems like a nice natural solution 
Um, also keep an eye on firewood. I have several pieces of firewood in the shed that have like a big X on them. Don't burn this one because I know somebody was nesting in it last spring, um, which means that they have not yet emerged. The bees are still in there. You can also provide some construction materials in the landscape. It's not just those nesting tunnels they need. They also need to be able to build, you know, the walls and partitions and use, you know, include their wallpaper so that they can make these nests like this. Um, and if you see this kind of damage on leaves in your landscape, these neat circular cuts out of the edges of leaves, that's the activity of leafcutter bees who have been taking pieces for their nests. And there are, none of them are 100% picky about what kind of plant they'll use. Some common favorites include rose, redbud, um, greenbrier, not that you really want to plant that, um, buckwheat and honeysuckle are all ones that they'll use um, for nesting material. And then of course there are species who use mud, pebbles, bits of sand, um, and resins also as construction materials. And those can be a little harder to provide intentionally, although certainly people who want to support um, particularly like blue orchard bees are, are a sought after species that uses mud in its nesting material. Um, you might, you know, if you're finding that their nesting rate is very slow or you've put up a bee hotel and they're not showing up, um, check the landscape for mud and see if there's, you know, a natural wet spot or do you need to make a little leak or a little um, mud trench for them. So that's some general info about cavity nesting bees. And we can also look at a few, few groups that are going to be coming out in the next month or two, starting with Osmia, which are our mason bees, um, including the blue orchard bee that I just mentioned. But we also have 21 other species in North Carolina, mostly native, also a few introduced. Um, and unfortunately, the introduced ones are kind of out competing the blue orchard bee, which is sad, um, but they use like the same size nest holes, the same everything. So it's hard to like have one and not the other. Um, so these bees, the mason bees use mud or chewed up leaves as their construction materials. And they're pretty general generalist foragers. Um, the blue orchard bees, particularly like red buds, fruit trees and cane fruits, uh, see their littler cousins a little later in the spring on white clover um, is very popular with them. This is what their nest interior will look like for the smaller, um, not for the blue orchard bee who uses mud, but for the smaller osmias use this chewed up leaf pulp. And to recognize an osmia, you're really looking for, I mean, their bodies are metallic blue, which is fairly distinctive, especially at this time of year. Um, and they also have a big head in proportion to their body size, which will help you tell them apart from some other blue bees that we're going to meet later. Then later in late spring um, on through the fall, the leaf cutting bees will come out and they're quite recognizable as black bees. They often have white stripes um, and then a bright yellow. <laughs> if they're collecting pollen, they pack it all over their bellies. And so they really stand out. Um, I've heard them, Debbie Roos, who took this photo, refers to them as flying Cheetos, which is about as good a description as, as you can get. There's also one species of Megachile, a leaf cutting bee, who's just all over black. Um, and then you'll also see her with pollen on her belly. She's very striking. So altogether, there's about 37, there are 37 species of this group in North Carolina. A few of them are introduced, including um, the blue, or including the alfalfa leaf cutting bee. Um, which was introduced actually as an alfalfa pollinator in the 40s or 50s. Um, but we see it around here not really being invasive, but it, it does show up. And so this is the group that uses leaves, also petal pieces, leaf pulp, mud, sand, resin, all manner of materials in their nest construction. And they're useful as pollinators. They're pretty generalist foragers. I see them pollinating cucumbers in my garden. They also are good for legumes like peas and beans. And if you do have a bee hotel or have, um, you know, mega Kylie cavity leaf cutting bees that you're watching their nests, you may see these bees go in and out as well. This is Celioxus cuckoo leaf cutting bee, and they're quite distinctive because they have a very pointy rear end. This is a parasitic bee that nests mostly or that parasitizes mostly nests of mega Kylie and uses this pointy rear end to kind of bash up the, the nest walls so she can get in to lay her own eggs. And you can, they're also recognizable. They and leaf cutting bees tend to hold their wings kind of out to the side, almost like a fly instead of 
um, folded over their back like many other bees. So look for that sharp tail and the wings out to the side. So those were our stem and wood renters and parasites. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our stem and wood builders, which are um, probably already quite familiar to you. This is our large carpenter bee, Xylocopa. There's actually two species here and they drill their own tunnels. They're recognizable from bumblebees because they've got a very shiny rear end, whereas bumblebees will have a furry one. And this is what they're doing um, to the inside of your deck boards. This is an x-ray of some redwood four by fours here from NC State campus. And the top image is in the fall when all of the adult bees are in there getting ready to hibernate over the winter. And then in the spring, the situation changes. Each nest is owned by just one or two female bees. And you can see their, um, you know, the pollen provisions and the nest walls in here at that point. So right now, they're all just loose adults in there. And in about a month, it's going to look like this image on the bottom. They also have some tiny cousins, the small carpenter bees. This is that other blue species that I mentioned, but its head is proportionally not as big and it's shinier and it's overall a smaller bee um, than the blue orchard bees or than the osmias that you'll see. Um, but there's six species of these little small carpenter bees in North Carolina and they all nest in pithy stems. Um, so things like sumac, elder, you know, all of those pithy stems plants that I mentioned earlier, they will nest in those stems and they must have the pith there because they use it to build their nest walls but they can't do any damage to wood the way their larger cousins do. They only use already dead exposed stems. All right, and then finally, um, our bumblebees are this little dot here we've got. Oh, I never remember the exact number, 14, somewhere around 15 species of bumblebees in North Carolina. So don't quote me on that because I have to look up the number every time. It's on that order. Here are a few of them. This is, these are queens of the common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. Um, this is a um, American bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus. So they're all very recognizable for being very fuzzy and then for packing pollen on their legs in these like sort of neat globs that are very well defined. They're, they moisten the pollen um, with nectar before they pack it on. So it's not just sort of loose all over the whole leg like you see in a lot of solitary bees. So where do bumblebees nest? It depends on the species. This is a Bombus impatiens, Eastern bumblebee coming out of a nest in the ground. Um, you wouldn't see it if you didn't see the, the bee coming and going. And these bees use um, old rodent burrows, like chipmunk burrows, that sort of thing um, for their nests. So they're deep underground. The ones we see most often are Bombus um, griseocollis, the black belted or the brown belted bumblebees who often nest in used in sort of uncleaned birdhouses. They like to use old bird nests. So they won't go in if the birds are there, but if there's an old bird nest sitting around in a birdhouse, they will use it the following spring. And what goes on inside, um, I think you might have already seen this picture tonight. So you'll have one queen bumblebee, might be this one, she looks rather large, um, who is the layer of eggs and everybody else are her daughters um, who are helping to take care of the nest. And it would be nice, um, given that bumblebees are so kind of economically important and some of the species are actually declining and that's linked to at least partly to climate change, possibly other reasons like introduce diseases. Anyway, bumblebees are very like helpful to humans as good pollinators and they're kind of in, in a broad sense in trouble. It would be great if we could support them by providing nesting habitat for them and there you can find any number of sort of bumblebee nest designs on the internet. But unfortunately, here in the Eastern US, those are almost never occupied. So basically, I should have put an X through this. I wouldn't actually bother trying to create an artificial nesting habitat for them. They're just so rarely used. Um, but what they do like are sort of messy forest edges, like the edge between an open area and the woods, um, where they'll find rodent burrows but it's not deep shade, but it's not baking sun either. So if you have those kinds of like sort of messy edge habitats, like preserve those, cause that's where bumblebees are most likely gonna find their nests. Some of them will also nest in clumping native grasses. So those are good for the landscape. And of course, birdhouses, like I mentioned, are really one of the easiest ways to get nesting habitat for bumblebees as well, for the few species that'll use those. And so 
what is the evidence that actually adding nesting habitat to to a landscape will increase bee populations. We do know from a few studies that nesting can be eliminating, like nest sites can be eliminating resource for bees. So logic follows that by adding them, we should be able to increase their populations, their abundance, their um, availability as pollinators. And there are a few studies supporting this. There's one in Maine blueberry fields that showed that adding nesting blocks for wild mason bees um, increased the number of bees foraging in those fields by about five five-fold, five times more bees um, after three years of having those nest blocks available. Um, a similar study in German orchards found that, you know, mason bee reproduction had increased about 35-fold in four years after adding nest boxes. Um, and then we also know, like, the other piece of evidence that suggests that adding nesting resources should be helpful is that the longer the distance that a bee has to commute between her nest and the flowers where she's gathering pollen and nectar, the lower her reproductive rate, the bigger the chances are that her nest will be parasitized while she's away. So we know that having food and shelter in close proximity is actually important for bees to be able to get things done. So we can't really think about either one in isolation. We've kind of got to have both requirements in the landscape together. And a lot of our small native bees will only fly maybe a tenth or a quarter of a mile. So even if these things aren't together in the same yard, that's fine, but they need to be kind of in the same city block um, for bees to be able to forage efficiently. And finally, I did have a specific request to address the issue of mosquito sprays and their effects on bees. And it's a topic that, that's always tough for me to address because there's so frustratingly little research. So we just kind of have to logic it out every time. Even just a couple of years ago, like the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign published a paper saying like, why don't we have more data about this? Um, so there aren't any studies showing that mosquito sprayed landscapes have fewer bees than non-mosquito sprayed landscapes. But we do know that most mosquito spray chemicals are broad spectrum insecticides that are highly toxic to bees. So if bees did contact those, it would kill or damage them. Um, and I think the point that links this to nesting that I've been talking about tonight is that oftentimes we're told that if we can, we can protect bees by not spraying on flowers or maybe by spraying in, in the evening when bees are not active. But you've seen from their nesting activities that bees don't just go to flowers. Like, yes, that's where they eat. But leaf cutting bees are out there collecting leaf pieces um, from plants that may not be flowering. And then they take those back to their nest and they're developing offspring or cuddled up against that leaf piece for months. Um, so not only is the adult bee handling it, the larvae are in contact with it for much longer. Um, they're nesting in stems that may, you know, may have been contacted by insecticide. They're nesting in soil and even bees who aren't themselves nesting in the soil may be collecting soil to construct a nest in stems. So when we're thinking about keeping a safe environment, for bees, we've got to think about not just keeping their flowers and their forage safe, but also keeping their nesting materials safe, which means among other things, like not getting mosquito sprays drifting onto them. Um, so I think that brings me to the point where I want to sum up. Um, we've looked at bee life cycles tonight and looked at kind of the part that's hidden away. Um, the life cycle can take anywhere from a month to a year to complete, but about 90, 80 or 90 percent of that time the bee is in a not very recognizable form in a place that we don't see it. Um, but in order to support the entire population of bees, we need to keep that part of the life cycle that is invisible safe as well. Um, we've got about 560 species of bees here in North Carolina and they all kind of do things differently. They have diverse nesting habitats and that diversity also contributes to their value as pollinators. Um, as far as supporting nesting, nesting bees. Um, habitat creation is really best established as bee hotels, as those artificial nest boxes for bees who would normally be using stems and wood. That can be helpful for those bees, but the majority wouldn't even recognize that as potential real estate. Most of them are nesting in the soil underground, and we know much less about how to actually cater to their needs. And so at this point, our best bet for bees that nest in soil and for bumblebees is to kind of be vigilant, watch for nesting bees. And if you find an area that's got them, keep it the way it is, like protect that set of conditions that has encouraged nesting. Um, 
and sort of so vigilance and benign neglect to um, support the areas that they have already chosen, even though we don't know in advance what areas those might be. All right, let me see if I can unshare my screen. Did I succeed in unsharing my screen? <laughs> All right, I can see Serena. So um, hopefully I have left enough time to do some questions. Yeah, I think so. That was great, Elsa. thank you. Um, I do not have a chat feature. Um, I don't know how many people may or may not. So we'll, um, Tara will monitor the chat because she can see it. And um, I will monitor people raising their hands. Um, if you like scroll over your um, screen there, it, you should see a little hand icon and you can um, tap on it. So um, the first person I saw raise their hand was Russ Olson. Um, you can unmute yourself and then ask your uh, question. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say this is one of the most informative presentations I've seen in recent memory. Uh, and as a Apis mellifera beekeeper, uh, I'm constantly asked questions uh, about what people are saying. And uh, this presentation has equipped me to answer those questions. And um, uh, I'm so my I don't have a question. I was just making a statement of thanks. Well, great. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person I see is Kristen Grubert. Hi, uh, I want to just second that, um, second Russ. This is great, nice and in-depth, really getting into the actual genius and species, which is awesome. Um, I do have a question with regard to uh, fire ants. Um, do we do we have issues where we kind of have to worry because fire ants is the only chemical that sometimes I, I don't broad spray it. I only pour it exactly on the nests. Um, but I'm wondering how, you know, does that impact the bees? Should That's literally the only chemical that's ever allowed anywhere in my property. Um, because, you know, they I've, I've seen them going after other creatures and stuff. So um, it's, how dangerous is that toward the bees if I'm very specific about it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something I've wondered about myself and other people in the entomology department here have wondered about. None of us have ever found any like clear yes or no research based answer. So I'm going to speculate a little bit, um, which is that I think you're probably OK if you're being that targeted, because if I were a ground nesting bee, like I would not want fire ants for neighbors either. And they're certainly not nesting like right in that same area. So you can certainly think through a scenario where, yeah, if you poison that fire ant nest and then the fire ants die and then that nesting space becomes available, maybe there's some residue in the soil and somebody else nests there, but it doesn't seem like a big risk to me. And given that we don't have the information to, you know, we don't have research to suggest that it's a huge risk, I think you're okay for now. Um, if things change, I will, I will let you all know. <laughs> okay, thank um, you. Tara, do you have any questions in the chat? We, we do not have any questions in okay. the chat at the moment. Thanks for checking, Serena. Yeah. Um, Carol Peoples, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, in my small town, they do some nice things to help control mosquitoes. They give out free mosquito dunks to residents, but they also during the summer will have the mosquito spraying trucks come around and I can place my property on a no spray list, but I'm not really sure that they don't spray. Is there any other way I can protect my pollinators um, beyond that? I feel like I, I really have no power over that situation. Yeah, that's a great question and a difficult situation. Um, and that's kind of the global tension with like pollinators versus mosquitoes, because we're kind of lucky here in that we don't have a lot of deadly diseases transmitted by mosquitoes at the moment, but there are parts of the world where it's like life or death, like you spray the mosquitoes or you get dengue. Um, so I appreciate the need to kill mosquitoes in many environments. Um, and it's something that's just, I mean, if you're talking about honeybees, like you can, you know, close them in on the day you know that it's gonna be sprayed or the day after. For wild bees, it's much harder to like 
know where they're nesting and know what they're going to do. So I don't have a lot of great advice. Do you know what time of day the sprays usually happen? Is it dusk? Like that's often recommended, but I don't know if that's the practice there. I think that they mostly come after dark. Yeah. So that's going to go a long ways toward protecting bees. Like a lot of the, the insecticides that are used for mosquito sprays have a fairly short half-life. Like they're very, they're photosensitive. So once the sun comes out, they start to break down and there should be less toxic material left, like on whatever plants were contacted. So that's, that's a plus that it's happening, at least for bees, it's a plus that it's happening at night. It's not a plus for fireflies, but that's a different story. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a more, a better, <laughs> better advice other than I'm glad it's at night. And if you've got honeybees, maybe close those in, but the wild bees are sort of on their own. Thank you. Um, Elsa, I just wanted to let you know, you don't have your video on. If you oh. turn it on, don't you don't have to, but I was just it really must like, go off when I share my screen or something because I thought I had it on. So all right, thanks. <laughs> no worries. I just noticed. Um I think the next person was Judith West. If you want to unmute yourself and ask. I was curious about the parasitic bees and if they just do the first chamber, if if it's a bunch of chambers of pollen and eggs are they only parasitizing the top one or are they somehow getting to all of them yeah that's a good question and i'm not sure i actually know the answer for all our parasitic bees so there are also some parasitic wasps who do very similar things and they and lay eggs like from the outside of the nest and just sort of hit every single every single chamber um, the parasitic bees, I think they're mostly open cell parasites, which means that they only come and like lay an egg in that first available chamber or in the first couple, like Celioxis with her pointy rear end and her sort of wall smashing abilities. She's got to go in a little bit farther. What I will say is that you don't usually see parasitic bees like wiping out entire nests or entire nest blocks of, of other bees. There are parasitic wasps who will do that, but the other, you know, the parasitic bees seem to be not quite as devastating to a host nest. Although they will hang around and sometimes you know, the mom bee will leave on a trip and they'll go in and parasitize that nest and then they'll like kind of wait around and then she'll leave again and they'll like go parasitize that nest. So they can definitely like make their presence known. Um, Carrie DiGiacco, I think you're next. Hey, I thought uh, Chris Gruber's question about the fire ant effect was pretty interesting. I wonder if you could talk to us at all about any um, studies that have shown any impacts that fire ants might have on ground nesting bees. Again, I don't know of anything, and I agree. Interesting question, and that's kind of been in, you know, I don't know if any of us are going to get around to doing any actual research on that anytime soon. Really interesting question. I agree, and that's that's about all I got at this point. I know that they, they've had tremendous impacts on ground nesting birds and on tortoises and things like that, so mm -hmm. just curious. Yeah, and I don't know if they would actually go in the nests and, you know, hunt larvae or if they would just be like a deterrent because of their activity. Yeah, I, I would love to know. <laughs> that is a good research question. Yep, for sure. <laughs> Maria LeBlanc, I think you're next. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Maria's other half, Frank. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just curious if dirt daubers predate uh, bees. If are they, they would dangerous, or are they or dangerous for bee population? Uh, nope, they are good neighbors. They actually hunt spiders to feed to their larvae. Um, mm -hmm. They and you know they might visit flowers alongside bees to get some nectar for themselves, but they're not hunting bees. They're not competing with bees for 
for resources. And in fact, some bees will actually use old dirt dauber nests for their own nests once the the dirt daubers are done with them. So they uh, they seem to get along fine. Well, good. We also <laughs> we also had a strange little look. It looked like a bumblebee, and they flew so fast. We couldn't really get a good view of them, but our yards are all natural, and they flew about within six to nine inches above the understory and just constantly moved, and we'd never seen those before. They were smaller than regular bumblebees, probably at least half size. Do you know what they were? I could take some guesses. <laughs> I've got 560 options, so <laughs> I wouldn't claim to be right. But what you're describing, like, was it many bees kind of? It was a, yes, it was. Yeah. It was probably at least uh, always 30 to 50 bees. They hovered right above the surface and you couldn't, they never stopped. And they were, they never flew, they never flew up. They, and I couldn't see them going down. Yeah, so I can tell you, better than I can tell you the species, I can tell you those are male bees, uh, huh. because that's, like, there are probably some nests down there on the ground, and the females kind of pop in and out, all business, off to get pollen, back to, like, lay an egg, and the males are swirling around over those nests, like, waiting to kind of pounce on a female on her way in or out, and so they're patrolling, um, and that's really common in mining bees and there are a few species of mining bees who look kind of like tiny bumblebees with some kind of like yellowish fur on the front mm -hmm. and black in the back so that it could have been one of them um coletes those cellophane bees will also have that behavior where there's some nests on the ground and the males are just patrolling so that uh -huh. would be is it's one of those groups okay thanks so much sure i'm gonna tara do you have anything in the chat right now there is nothing in the chat. You're okay. good. Cool. Um, I had a question, and then I'll get to Kristen. Um, when you were talking about checking the firewood for nesting bees, what does that look like? You just have to see them coming and going. Okay. Because, yeah, a lot of firewood, like once you cut it, you reveal like, oh, there was a beetle hole or whatever in it. And then that beetle hole is what the bee would be nesting in. But Sometimes you'll see a little bit of like pollen stain around the entrance, like as they're coming and going, they leave a little smudge of pollen, but really you kind of just have to see them coming and going to know that this hole is in use and that one's not. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, Kristen Gruber, did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to comment on, uh, I think it was Carol Peoples who was talking about the, um, the spraying. Um, I have neighbors that spray, and one of the things, I don't know how much you can do or what kind of control you have on that, but I found that some inexpensive, um, I actually have a, um, like a weed buffer between their property and mine, um, but this time of year when everything's died down, you know, there's kind of openness, so I actually bought some of those really inexpensive willow, like, fences, almost like the wattle fences. Um, and I kind of have that in some strategic spots so that um, if they spray, it might kind of slow it down a little bit. I don't know if she has that option, um, but it's one of the things I did because I have, I don't have an HOA, but there's an HOA in the group behind me and they spray for like freaking everything. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> they spray for everything <laughs> and it makes me nuts. So, um, so I don't know if maybe she could check, check a look, take a look into that. Um, maybe certain type of inexpensive fencing. But that's that. But thanks, guys. Thank cool. you. Yeah, anything to slow down drift should help. Should. Um, Marina, did you have a question? Yeah, my question will be: How long do we have to leave the firewood? Because early spring, I had. To tons of wild bees coming in and out and when I did split the firewood I didn't see any life anymore oh. so how long do we have to spare the wood yeah and that's a tricky thing that comes into like when you're managing just a bee hotel too even if it's not firewood like any of these cavity nesting bees um so let's say you're talking about a bee who's who emerges as an adult like in the spring and let's say April. And so that bee will be active for, you know, maybe a month or so, build new nests. And then 
those larvae will be in there all the way until the following April. So it's hard to time it right when there's just nobody home. Um, and I say April as an example, some bees, you know, nest in August, some bees nest in, you know, all the way up until first frost. So it's really hard to know when it's gonna be empty. And what you do if you have a bee hotel is when you're ready to like clean it out, empty it, you take the nesting material out, you put it in a box and you put like one little bee sized hole in the box so that everybody who emerges will leave through that hole, but it's not attractive to come back in. And once that's been sitting for a whole growing season from spring through fall, then you know everybody's out um, and you can take it apart, clean it, compost it, whatever. With actual firewood, <laughs> that's a lot harder to know. And so if you see somebody in it one spring, you couldn't really be sure that they've left until the following spring. So that kind of puts that firewood out of commission, but it's interesting that you say you've split it and actually didn't find anybody in there. How Lag time between when you saw nesting and when you went back and split it? We saw them very early spring and we did split them at the start of the heating season, maybe late in the year. Yeah. And I didn't see anything huh. in it. So I was really not sure if they only stayed for a month, if that were the first ones or if I didn't see them, but I would see larvae, wouldn't I? Yeah, I would expect you to have seen larvae or pupae or some sort of, you know, the overwintering stage in yeah. there. So either like something happened to them or they were in and out checking it and being like, oh, actually, we're not going to nest here. Maybe you just saw them like house shopping and they didn't didn't nest mm -hmm. or else something something happened to them maybe they turned out you know a nest full of wasps and those those left or something yeah things could happen but yeah that's interesting and normally it would kind of take a full year before you can be sure full year okay okay great great thank you any more questions from anybody all right well, thank you guys all so much for coming and thank you also for that great presentation. Um, and be sure to check out our Facebook or our website to, you know, stay in touch with us and um, for our upcoming events and stuff. So, yeah, thank you.